as we get ready to praise God. Sing, send it on down. Send it on down. church. Oh, we can do better than that. Praise the Lord, church. Awesome. You may be seated. If you're a guest here today, we want to thank you for coming. You are here by divine purpose. You're not here by accident. In front of you, we have a card called the Connect card. And if you're a visitor or if you're a guest here for the first time or even the second time, we want you to fill this out. And then after the service, you can take it back to guest services where they have a gift, a gift for you. We want to connect with you. We really do. We have a special guest here in the house. Uh, this morning in the front row sitting with us is a judge from the Milwaukee County Circuit Court, Judge Scott A. Wales. Judge Wales will be in the foyer if you want to talk to him. He's a part of uh, Branch 47, right? Branch 47 in the uh, Milwaukee County Circuit Court. So if you want to talk to him afterwards, you can, you can talk to him in the foyer area. Thank you so much for coming. We appreciate it. It's always good for us to, to pray for our leaders. Amen. Well, I am excited. I am excited about this morning. All right, I have a... I'm just going to say it. I have a friend who's been going through a Bible study, and she decided that this morning she wanted to get baptized in Jesus' name. And she brought her parents with her who live out in Menominee Falls. But wait, there's more. I have a friend, uh, and some of you may know him. His name is Keith Nichols, and he's a firefighter brother of mine who works for the city of Cut or for the city of uh, Franklin. And two days ago, I got a text message from from someone who said he got the Holy Ghost two days ago. Hallelujah. 
But wait, there's more. A friend of mine who's going through a Bible study, her name is Kim, and she got baptized last Sunday in the name of Jesus Christ. And I asked her, I said, Kim, what made you decide to get baptized? And she said, Andrew, she's like, I just want to be new. She's like, all the junk and all the garbage I've done, I just want to be a new creature in Christ. And I said, you know what, Kim? When you go under the water, you go under the blood. Everything you did in the past is wiped clean in the name of Jesus. But wait, there's more. All right, the Sunday before that, the Sunday before Super Bowl Sunday, I was talking with uh, Brother Steve Miller, who does Bible studies, and he had a he had a, a man who who was he taught a Bible study to. Who, by the way, uh, Brother Tom Paquin taught a Bible study to 10, 12 years ago, and for whatever reason, he just didn't make that decision to come to church and get baptized. Well, Steve sent him through a, or taught him a Bible study, and two Sundays ago, Chris came to church on a Sunday night and. And Brother Steve Miller brought him up to the altar to pray for him. And, and Brother Steve Miller's like, bro, you know how he likes to say that, bro. He was like, I got to be honest with you. I'm, I'm frustrated because you know the truth. And I'm wondering what's hanging you up. What's stopping you from getting baptized? And Chris said, Steve, I came here tonight to get baptized in Jesus' name. And if I'm Steve, if I'm Steve, I'd, I would have been like, bro, you should have led with that. All right. <laughs> So Chris goes into the waters of baptism, gets baptized in Jesus' name. He comes out, raises his hand, and he gets filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. But wait, there's more. Right. A couple of weeks before that, uh, Brother Dave Torres and uh, Sister Angel Torres are teaching, a, they're teaching an end times Bible study in the cafe on a Thursday night. And one of Angel's co-workers is there, and she starts asking about the Holy Ghost. They pray for her in the cafe. She receives the gift of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues. There is something that is going on. When we teach the Word, when we're teaching Bible studies, God says, my Word will not come back void. There are things that are going on right now in this church, and I'm telling you, for everyone who's getting involved, thank you for pushing away from the table and getting out into the harvest field. All right, well, I'm done preaching. So uh, let's bow your heads. Let's pray for the service. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we come together, Lord God, in one mind and one accord, in unity, Lord Jesus, with an expectation, Lord, that you are here and that you are going to do a wonderful work. We, we come together with the expectation that people are going to be filled with the Holy Ghost and baptized in Jesus' name. Bless the service, Lord God. Bless the preaching. Anoint, open up hearts, minds, and understanding. Bless the remainder of the service. In your precious name, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning and welcome to the weekly Parkway Church video update. My name is Ty and I will be giving you a brief look at all of the exciting things happening right here at Parkway Church. Tonight at 6 o'clock in the worship center, we do have our Edify service. There's child care available for infants through age 4, stories in the park for kids between 5 and 11, and crew 412 for teens between 12 and 18. This coming Saturday, February 18th, in the worship center, there will be joint men's and ladies prayer, and that will begin at 8.30 a.m. Becoming a Contagious Christian is our small group series, and it begins today. It will run through April 8th. You can pick up your participants guide right here in the Stillwaters Bookstore after this service. You can stop by the kiosk for more information. Anybody is welcome to visit or to lead a small group. Parkway Church has a few specialty groups available. Along with Grief Share, Divorce Care is starting tomorrow, February 13th at 6.30 p.m. right here in the Stillwaters Cafe. 
For more information on divorce care, you can contact Laureen Thompson. The Parkway Church Sunday PM Child Care will now be in a different location. Stories in the Park will be right here in Bible Land, and infants through age four will be right here in the twos and threes Sunday school classroom. We are looking for volunteers to help us with Sunday PM child care. You can apply online at www.theoakcreekchurch.com under the Connect tab. Purpose Institute. Parkway Church's on-campus ministry training program will be taking place this Friday and Saturday. The Friday evening session is open to anybody that's interested in Purpose Institute. The Saturday sessions are for enrolled students only. To find out how you can enroll, please email for you at theoakcreekchurch.com. As always, if you have any questions about anything that's been announced, you can pick up a 411 information sheet, stop by the Parkway Happenings wall, or visit us online, www.theoakcreekchurch.com. Now please enjoy this service. Let's once again stand to our feet as we prepare to worship the Lord. Are you ready to get your breakthrough this morning? We've got a new song to teach you today. It's all about getting your breakthrough. I don't know about you, but I'm going to get mine. I'm going to get mine today. I don't need an invitation. I'm going to get my breakthrough this morning. Right. 
make their way forward I got so excited when I heard Andrew talking about all of the things that have happened the spirit and feelings, the baptisms God is moving amongst us and we are so thankful for that today and I just have to say but wait there's more Jordan was filled with the Holy Spirit last week why don't we give a round of applause to God for what he's done? Let's give him a round of thanks. Thank you, Jesus. The Holy Spirit is for anybody. Anybody can receive it, and it is a gift from God. I'm sorry if we got a little crazy on you today, but sometimes we just have to let it out. We're going to go into a a series of songs for our offering. Don't worry, I'll pray for the offering. Ushers, after I pray, you can start. And these are some songs that when I was a little blonde-haired kid laying under the pews, my mom can affirm that, she's here somewhere. I was laying under the pews, I would hear the organ start whirring, and Sister Rogers would start singing these songs, and I was like five, so I was hanging out under the pew. But the lyrics stuck with me. And because one of these songs is so heavy on the doctrine, I get excited every time I hear it. And some of you might know, I know I warned some of the saints that they should get excited because they may not need to look at the screens for these lyrics, which is a good thing. Uh, because these songs have, as we've heard, withstood the test of time because their message is forever. And I don't know about you, but I believe that the mighty God is Jesus. And he is the Prince of Peace. And that the fullness of the Godhead dwells in him. So, we're going to pray. And then we're going to sing. And while we're singing, if you feel to do whatever you need to do, here's your chance to get it out with invitation while we sing these songs. God, we thank you, Lord, for these offerings that we bring. God, we thank you, Jesus, for the provisions that you've given to us. And we give that back to you, God. We surrender our increase back to you, God. Bless this offering as it is used for your kingdom. Bless this service today. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The mighty God is Jesus. The Prince of Peace is He. The everlasting Father. The King eternally. The wonderful in wisdom.
probably about the only question that would be appropriate at this moment is, so do you have the Holy Ghost this morning? If, because if you, if you do, then you should have been able to affirm with the words of the song. And if you don't, as Ty said so eloquently, it is a gift. It is a promise for each and every one of you. I, uh, as, as I was listening to the, the medley of songs, uh, you know, I am the guy of the old song. And I, I happened to receive a text message from a friend of mine this past week. And it was a screenshot of what a, a prominent uh, preacher uh, tweeted out. And in a, in a day and age in which it seems like tweets are out of control, um, this tweet actually, I actually got something out of this tweet. And he said, pastors, teachers, worship leaders, parents, are you teaching those under your care? Songs that will be able to be sung a cappella around a hospital bed in 50 years. Now, be careful, because I like all the songs. But I will say this. There isn't an importance to the past, if for no other reason than this. It reminds us of where we were, and from where the Lord brought us from. And these songs have a way of taking us back to where we were and helping us to remember that it really has gotten very little to do with us because it really is all in Him. And He does deserve all the glory and all of the honor and all of the praise. And so uh, I know they're standing by Wondering, will I sing an old song? But I'm not going to. So thank you very much. I would ask that you would grab your Bibles this morning and uh, you can turn to 1 Samuel, the 15th chapter. I would make a recommendation to all of you this morning. I, I bring my iPad every service. Uh, I, I probably carry my iPad around more than I carry my Bible around. Thankfully, my I have many Bibles that are contained within the, the screen and the metal back of my iPad. But the reality is there's something very special about the words upon the paper when it is in your hand. And, and here's the other thing why I would tell you I would encourage you to bring your physical Bible with you to church. There are times that you will be sitting in a service and uh, a, a preacher will get up to speak or somebody will get up to give a testimony and they will reference a scripture or a story or something of a principle from the word of God. And in those moments, you want to be able to underline you. If you were to look at and I have a number of Bibles, but my Bibles are filled with markings and highlighted scriptures and there are times when I am feeling, I'm feeling discouraged. I'm feeling beat down, heavy. There may be times I'm feeling times of victory and celebration. And I will, I will simply grab my Bible. And I'll sit down in my place with my Bible. And I'll ask the Lord to speak to me. Now I believe that I can turn on my iPad and God will direct me right to a scripture. But there are promises that I have outlined in this Bible that some days I can just simply open it. And a promise that God spoke to me, a rhema word, a fresh word specifically for my life, for my time, I have, will have highlighted at some other point. And I will open and there it will be. And so I would encourage you, it's not a requirement uh, there may even be times that I forget my Bible because I think it's here or I think it's at home or it's not my favorite one, and I won't have it. You can come up and chastise me for that. But bring your Bible. So 1 Samuel, the 15th chapter, and before I, before I go any further, I, I want to uh, make you aware. I know that you've by now noticed that Pastor and Sister Diane are not with us this morning. 
Uh, they are on vacation and uh, they will be gone uh, this Sunday, next Sunday. Um, but I would ask that you would pray for them. They are traveling between Florida and Georgia and then back here and that the Lord would just keep his hand upon them as they travel. And uh, there are a number of needs throughout this congregation. I know that we have some that uh, have been in the hospital. Some have family that have been in the hospital. There's some some very desperate needs amongst this congregation. So after I read our text, I would ask that uh, you remember those things and, and that you you lift them up before the Lord. So First Samuel, the 15th chapter, the 22nd verse. And it says, and Samuel said, hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected thee from being king. This was Samuel speaking to King Saul. Uh, at the time, let's let's pray for this message and, and let's remember the request that I made mention to you this morning. Lord, we love you today. We're so thankful for your faithfulness to us. We thank you, O oh God, for your word forever settled in heaven. God, that brings life to us. That is a a light unto our feet, a light to our path. God, that we're able to to walk in the way and be pleasing to you. I pray this morning that your word would come alive, God, that it would spring forth into life through us, O oh God, and that we would bear fruit of righteousness from it. I also pray, God, for uh, Pastor and Sister Tamil as they are on vacation and traveling, God, that you would keep your hand of protection upon them, bringing them home safe to us. And for each and every need, God, that we know that is represented within this congregation, that you would do a work, God, that you would touch, Lord, that you would make every bit whole, that we might stand before this assembly and give testimony to your continued faithfulness to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I, uh, I would also like to extend a, a very warm welcome to all of our guests that are here this morning. Uh, we are very thankful that you are here. It is always a, a pleasure for us to have you with us, and it is uh, an honor to have Judge Wales with us this morning. And, and as it was mentioned, please see him in the foyer after the service. Amen. I know that he is uh, running for an office, and so I would, I would like to give him an opportunity if anyone would like to speak with him after the service to do so. Uh, I would also, uh, we're, me, and brother, me and Brother Wales are going to have a conversation right now. You don't have to answer out loud, but uh, I'm just wondering from your position of authority and prestige, are we certifiable crazy or are we okay? We're better than okay, he says. You see, when we get into a relationship with Jesus, I will tell you there's only one way to be, and that's all in. Because unless you get all in with him, you cannot please him. So I... I'm thankful that you are here today. Thank you for humoring me with that. So this morning, I want to tell you a story. This is, uh, and I apologize to the translators and the projectionists, but I'm going to be all over the place today. Uh, but the story here that we find in 1 Samuel, the 15th chapter, we find that, that Samuel, the prophet, the preacher, the pastor, has come to the king, and he has given him an instruction from God. And the instruction is that he is to go to the city of Amalek and that he is to wage war against the king of Amalek and the Amalekites. Now, the reason for this instruction is because when the children of Israel had passed over the Red Sea, had come out of Egypt and had come into their journey of the promised land, that the Amalekites had done damage to them, had treated them poorly, had took many lives of the children of Israel, and the Lord was determined to settle that score. And so Samuel gives instruction to King Saul, and he says, you're to go down to the city of Amalek, you're to besiege it, 
and you're to do battle against it. But when you do battle against it, the instruction was this. Now, I'm going to caveat just a little bit and tell you that I understand that some of the things that you read in Scripture, some of the narrative from those days may trouble us in our current society and culture. But I want you to understand God is sovereign and it is not your place or my place to ever feel the need to justify the actions of God, nor to give excuse or substance for why he did or did not do what he did. He is God and he can do whatever he pleases. So we find that the instruction that's given to King Saul is that he's supposed to go down, besiege the city, do battle against it. And he's supposed to kill every man, every woman, every child. And God is so specific in the fact that he wants this, this culture completely eradicated that he goes as far as to say, including every nursing child, not to mention every bit of livestock. There was to be nothing that had the Amalekite culture attached to it that was to survive. It was supposed to all be utterly destroyed. So King Saul takes the children of Israel and they go down to the city of Amalek. They besiege it. They lay in wait. But God had given them one other instruction. And there was a group of people who had joined themselves to the Amalekites. And, and they had done good things to the children of Israel. And so God had told, them, told King Saul to tell them, hey, you better get out. Because we're about to put a whooping on these people. And if you're here, you're going to get hurt. And so... These people were given a warning and they leave and, and King Saul and the children of Israel began to wage this battle. And, and before long, everything is destroyed. Well, almost everything. King Saul decides to save a couple things. He decides to spare the life of King Agag. Now, if you remember, the instruction that was given to him was that he was to kill everybody. But he spares the king. And then he spares the choice livestock, the, the cattle and, and the goats and the sheep and whatever the spoils were. He decides to keep them. Samuel the prophet is not with them at this battle. And the Lord comes to Samuel and he begins to speak to Samuel about what has happened. And, and the Lord is very upset. I would say in, in our current vernacular, he would have been extremely irritated with Saul. He was so irritated that he was heartbroken. The Bible says that Samuel, having this understanding that Saul had rejected the authority of God, stayed up all night weeping before the Lord, making intercession for King Saul. The Bible says that on the next day that the Lord told Samuel, how long are you going to stay here sucking your thumb, whining about this guy? I've rejected him. Go find him and go give him my judgment. And so we find that Samuel begins to make his way to where King Saul is. And, and as he's making his way, he finds out that King Saul. Now you have to remember, let me explain something about King Saul. When, when the children of Israel decided that they wanted to have a king, it was not the will of God to give them a king, but because they continued to whine and complain, you know, it seems like we as people have been whining and complaining since the very beginning of time. And I wonder sometimes, why do I think it's ever going to be any different? The people of God always seem to find something to complain about. And I'm talking about myself. And it frustrates God, but so... God, in his frustration with the children of Israel, give them a king. Give them what they want. But he gives them a warning. But in this king, he finds Saul. Now, you have to understand that Saul was a humble man. Saul was a good-looking guy. He was taller than everybody else. He was, he was built to be a king. When Samuel found him, he was hiding because he didn't like, he was bashful. He didn't want nothing to do with it. And Samuel anointed him to be king. But now we find Saul in a place that after having disobeyed the direct command of God, goes to Mount Carmel and he sets up a monument after this battle, after this victory. And the, the monument is not to give glory to God, 
But the monument is to give recognition to him. All of a sudden, the humble man becomes awful full of himself. And so it's not too long after Saul leaves Mount Carmel that Samuel catches up to him. And Saul says, hey, pastor, I did everything God said, and we had a great victory. And Samuel says, then, what is the lowing or the mooing of the cattle that I hear? And who is that? And Saul immediately says, the people. You see, it's in our nature that when God gives us a command and we decide to do our own thing, that we find ways to justify and deflect the responsibility to somebody else because we know it's our fault, but we hope that maybe we can fool God and the judgment won't come upon us. But nevertheless, Samuel says, um, who is that? And he says, well, the people wanted me to, to spare the king and wanted me to keep the livestock because we were going to make a sacrifice unto God. Samuel says, he makes a statement, two words, and he says, be quiet. In our language today, it would have been shut up. Probably if I'd have been Samuel, I'd have been shut up, dummy. I'm going to, and this is what he says. Now, I'm going to tell you what God told me all last night about you. And he begins to talk about the fact that Saul had disobeyed and God now had rejected him as the king. Saul is obviously upset. But Samuel makes a statement to him and he says this in, in verse 17. He says, when thou wast little in thine own sight... Wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? Reminding Saul that there was a day and a time in his life where he was humble under the hand of God, that he was willing to do the things that God had required of him. But now the inference is that he's too big for his britches and that he's decided he can do whatever he wants and, and God will receive it. And Samuel tells him that God has... No delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices. That, that the, the act of rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Let me help you understand what this means. And, and I might be teaching a little bit today. I'll, I'm sure I'll be preaching. That's just who I am. But the reality is when, when you get to the place that God gives you an instruction of something to do, you are to be obedient to the will of God. But now listen, hear me when I say this. When you decide to do what it is that you would rather than to follow the command of the Lord, you are in rebellion. Now, I want you to understand this morning, I'm not speaking about um, as your pastor that you are in rebellion and that you need to obey and allow me to control your life. Okay, That's not what I'm talking about. What I am talking about is being obedience to the lordship or the headship of Christ in your life. That he is the king of your life. That you surrender your will and your destiny and your desires to whatever it is that he desires for you. And when you get to the place that he gives you instruction and you decide that's not what I want to do. So I'm going to do this instead. You are in rebellion. And when Samuel says that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, I would have you to understand that witchcraft is a demonic spirit. And when you are in rebellion, you are no longer under the control of God Almighty. You've allowed yourself to come under the authority of another spirit. And so it is a dangerous place to walk in rebellion to the command and the instruction of God. So... I would, I would tell you this morning, if God has been speaking to you about some things, it would be in your best interest to submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. So we, we find that Samuel then speaks to him in verse 22 and verse 23, which we read, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and, and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. God does not care. 
He desires certain sacrifices from us, but it is not the sacrifice that he desires. The thing that he desires from us is obedience, that the things that he requires that we willingly walk in submission to his will. And so we find here that Samuel tells Saul, God has rejected you as the king of Israel. Saul, this is how foolish we get at times. Saul, in hoping to, to make uh, a show of continued unity and strength in God, asks the prophet, he says, well, will you at least do me this one favor? I understand God's rejected me. He said, but will you at least walk out with me so that the elders see us together and assume that it's all well between me and God? How can we get to the place that we would rather wear a facade that I'm a believer, that I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, but yet be in such deception that it is the appearance that other people would see that is more important than what God sees? You see, I feel sometimes that we as believers are doing more to prove to one another that we're walking in obedience to God than we've ever done to show God that we're walking in obedience to Him. I could go on a whole long laundry list of things. But I won't belabor that point this morning, but we have to understand that God desires, and not just desires, but He commands obedience in those that would follow him. It is not your choice. It is a prerequisite to being in the kingdom of God. It is a prerequisite of being a child of God. So we find that Samuel, decide, he just ignored him and he begins to walk out and Saul grabs him by the coat and, and as Samuel tries to pull away, it rips his coat and Samuel now is irritated. You ruined my suit coat. He turns around and he says, just as you've rent this garment, God has rent the kingdom from your hand and will give it to another. And there is something extremely troubling in this story, and it's found in verse 35 of this chapter. And it says this, And Samuel, the pastor, the voice of God in Saul's life, came no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul. And the Lord repented, or in our vernacular today, regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. I wonder how many of us that God has given giftings and abilities, that he's anointed our lives to do great and marvelous things for the kingdom of God, have we done things or walked in rebellion to who God is and what God would desire to the place that as we would wring our hands in frustration, has God sat and looked at us and said, I regret giving them that ability. I regret choosing them for this purpose. Think about that. I don't think that Saul is an anomaly in Scripture. I think that if we were to look at Saul, we would find at times in our own lives some very close similarities to him. Because I remember that when I came to God, I desired everything about God. I wanted to know everything about God. I wanted to do everything He wanted me to do. But somewhere along the way, I decided... Maybe that's not as important as I thought. And God would understand why I don't witness. God would understand why I don't live a holy life. God would understand why I want some of these things of the world in my life. They're good things. God wouldn't withhold a good thing from me. But we justify and allow ourselves to become deceived into walking in disobedience to who God is. See, as the Lord spoke through Samuel to Saul. There was a time where it didn't matter what God wanted us to do, we would do it, no matter how crazy it seemed. Do you, do you remember when God would move on you in the early days of your walk with Him and, 
and you'd get out in the aisle and you would dance and you'd shout. You didn't care. But now, boy, hard to pick my feet up. And, and I, start, I start making deals with God. God, if so-and-so goes by me, I'll go. If the light turns green after it's been green, I'll witness that person at the coffee store. You see, we make all these deals because we're trying to justify our, our reasoning for being disobedience to the will of God. My title today is the language of the kingdom. The language of the kingdom is not love, it's not hope, it's not peace, it's not faith, it's not grace, it's obedience. You see, and everything flows out of obedience. Everything flows through obedience in the kingdom of God. But it, nevertheless, it still bothers me when I think about Saul. It bothers me that our God, our all-knowing, the, the sovereign God, and the timeless one that we know as God, could get to a place that he would regret his actions when it comes to the decisions of one of his children. It concerns me. I will tell you, I had one of these moments this past week as I was continuing to go over this message, and I thought, God, has there ever been a moment where you regretted picking me? You know how it is, any of you that ever played sports, and you pick a team, right? And there's always that one person that nobody wants. So they're always saying, you can go first, because... If I go last, and I won't be stuck with them, right? You know who that person is. But somebody gets stuck with that person. And you just know they're going to do something dumb. They're going to mess it up somehow. And I thought, God, did you ever feel that way about me? Did I ever do something or not do something? And you thought... I wish I wouldn't have anointed him for that. I wish I wouldn't have gave him that talent, that ability. You see, the Bible says that the callings and giftings of God are without repentance, which means he will not take them back from you. If he's given you a gift, if he's given ability to you, they are yours for life. But listen, just because you have that gifting and that ability and you operate fluently in it does not mean that the favor or the approval of God is upon your life. Just because God has given to somebody the gift of healing and they go around healing scores of people does not mean that God is in approval of their life. It just simply means that God is faithful to his word. But I wonder, is it possible that he would regret the decision in my life? I pray that that's not the case. But you see, if we are to think about obedience... God has set order in all of his creation. There is nothing outside of his law. There is nothing that exists outside of his order that he has determined. The planets and the stars are told where to stay. They're giving, given a trajectory. The waters upon the face of the earth are given boundaries. The sun is told where to stay in relationship to our planet. God gave instruction to his creation and he told them in the book of Genesis to be fruitful and to multiply after their kind. And we see that this continues even still today. All of creation obeys the Lord. All of creation obeys the Lord. And if it was not for the obedience to God's order, we would not be here today. In Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter, there is a, a, a bit of discourse that happens between the Lord and his people. And in the 28th chapter, this is what it says. Uh, the first and second verse. Now it will be if you will diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God. And I want you to understand that, yes, I intentionally used the MEV this morning. I could use the, a varying number of them, but... Um, the, the King James speaks to the commands of the Lord, but for us today, uh, so that we have an understanding in our vernacular, I use this translation. If you will diligently obey, 
or hearken unto the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all, not some, not the ones you like, not the ones that fit your situation, but all his commandments, which I am commanding you today, then the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth, and all these blessings will come on you and overtake you if you listen to the voice of the Lord your God. You see, there is a blessing that is promised, but the blessing has a prerequisite. It will only come if you are walking in obedience to God. Now, there is a promise that God makes as you continue through the chapter and you go into chapter 29. You find that the promise is a promise of a curse. If you are disobedient and you do not adhere to the commandment of the Lord, there will be curses that will come upon both you, your family, your finances, everything that you put your hand to do. So there is a blessing that we desire, and that blessing comes through obedience to God's word and his will. But in our current understanding and, and definition, if you will, the word obey comes with all sorts of negative connotations attached to it. We unfortunately view obedience as some sort of, I don't know, some sort of forced and, and unwilling decision to do something we otherwise would not do. And we simply do this because we are fearful of the consequence, consequences of those uh, actions or as a result of our disobedience. We equate obedience as an escape from what otherwise would be certain punishment. Now I know that the scripture tells us that without faith, it is impossible to please God. And I know that the word tells us that without faith, an individual will not see the Lord. But I would submit to you this morning a little bit deeper, a little bit deeper than just faith. And even before love, there must be obedience. For you see, when we have a biblical understanding of obedience, we come to realize that it is comprised of three things. And these three things are love, trust, and action. When I am obedient to God, the more I fall in love with Him, I, I would just say this, obedience and love are inextricably tied together. It is impossible for you to love God without being obedient to God. It's impossible for you to be obedient to God without loving God. Do you see how this works? And so it's pretty easy for you then to take the temperature of the relationship that you have with God simply based on either one of those two. Because if, if one is lacking, then there is something that is amiss in the entirety of the relationship. There is a writer who penned these words, and her name is Lois Evans, and she said this, Obedience is our love language for God. Jesus said in John the 14th chapter, he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. And then he goes on in verse 23 and verse 24, further emphasizing the thought. And he says, all who love me will do what I say. Anyone who doesn't love me will not obey me. So I got to wonder this morning. Do we love him? Are we obedient to him? That is a question for you this morning. Understand that our love is proven by our obedience. You say you love God, but the fruit of your life may, something, may say something entirely else. Mm, I could stay here for a little bit. The things that are in your life that you know that are not pleasing to God... <laughs> if there are things in your life that you know are not honoring of God, I don't have to argue and debate with you about the fact whether or not your love for God is genuine. I don't. If you want to tell me you love him, help yourself. Because God is telling me that your fr the fruit of your life, the actions which you do, proves it's the fact check of your love. See, if I love him, I obey him. If I love him, I serve him in the ways that he desires for me to serve him. 
And if it doesn't, then I would be afraid to tell you that you're a liar because you do not love him like you think you love him. You have some sort of casual affair with him. You like to pretend he's your homeboy and everything's good with you and God. But the reality is, mm -hmm. there's a scripture in the New Testament that says our righteousness is as filthy rags. You can make yourself believe that everything is good. But if the book says something different, it would be my plea for you today that you would find a place of prayer, that you would find a place of recommitment and say, God, I know I'm a sinner. I know I make mistakes. I know I've been making mistakes and I want to do better. Listen, I don't expect any one of us to walk perfectly before the Lord. We are going to fail. If we didn't, I would not be standing here today. But you see, the Bible tells me the, the prophet speaking to the enemy. He said, oh, my enemy, if I fall down, surely I will rise again. The scripture also says that a goodly man will fall seven times. But the difference is he'll get back up and he'll continue to move forward. That's who we need to be. Allow God to check us and to check our obedience to his word and to the his will for our lives and when we're found lacking then we make corrections and we get back into alignment with the master so the first and the greatest commandment deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 5 and you shall love the lord your god with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might the scriptures make it very clear that god loves us but the scripture also makes it very clear that our first priority in life is that we are to love him and to love him like nothing else. There's not supposed to be anything that's equal to him or greater than him in our life. We are to love him as he loved us. The Bible, the entire theme of the Bible is the self-revelation of God and his love for his creation for us. We understand that before the foundations of the world that God established a plan by which to redeem his creation that he knew would fail. He knew that we would fail. And before having ever made us or fashioned us, he was willing to have a plan to sacrifice himself on a cross that we might ultimately love him and walk in obedience in accordance with to a covenant relationship with Christ. Obedience, then, I would say this morning, comes from knowing that God loves you and then you loving him in return. It's your actions because of your love and your trust and your action that proves uh, that is the fact check of your obedience to God. Folks don't like the concept of obedience when it comes to relationship with God. I'm just going to be clear and simple with you this morning. They'd rather equate it to a simple assent or a choice or some other soft concept that we have manufactured within the church. They would distort the truth by causing others to think that obedience is about fearing God. But God wants us to see obedience to him as a relationship of love. And out of love, then, as I said, comes trust. And if you trust what God is saying to you and you believe that he loves you, then that will lead you to an action. You need to have all three of those evident in your life because action without love is just simply religion. And love without action is simply just empty talk. You're just flapping your gums in the breeze, saying lots of stuff, but nothing's ever happening. But when I'm walking in obedience based upon this love relationship that I have with God, there is nothing that is impossible for me. I do not fear what my enemy can do to me because I am secure within the relationship I have with God because of my obedience to his word. Watch this this morning. I, in, in 1 Samuel, the 17th chapter, there is a story that many of us probably know and I'm always leery to stand up in here and say, you know the story of, because uh, it's not fair, because not everybody knows the story of, right? So there's a story in 1 Samuel, the 17th chapter of David and Goliath. 
And probably most everybody in here has heard some form of this story. Now, we have seen it done in cartoons, good old veggie tales, and cartoon style, and comic books, and in my adventure Bible as a young child. But it never quite tells the entirety of the story. But you see, there is something here that you need to get from this story. So we find that there was a problem, and this problem was a big enemy, a nine-footer and, and he had a big mouth, and he was a, a man of war, and everybody was afraid of him. But there's something here that we see a difference between Saul and David. Now, you need to understand that when we read in 1 Samuel 15, and, and the Lord then in chapter 16 re has rejected Saul, and he sends Samuel on a new mission to anoint the next king, which is David, we find that the process of the call and the anointing, the substance used for anointing, the, the challenge given, they're all the same. They were anointed by the same man, used oil in a flask, an, in a horn uh, flask. They, they had it poured upon their head. They were anointed to be the king of Israel. So called to do the same thing. And then a common problem shows up for both of them. And the problem is Goliath. But for some reason, there's two different responses to the problem. You see, while Goliath comes out and starts to shoot off his mouth, Saul's in the tent, and, and pardon me, but he's wet in his pants, shaking, and he's afraid, he's hiding. But the response of David, on the other hand, shows up and he says, who is this idiot? Who is this guy that would defy the armies of the Lord? Does he know who he's talking to? How is it that two guys with the same anointing, called to do the same work, would have two different responses? Uh, I think I can tell you. It's because one of them was walking in obedience to the will of God. One of them had put some deposits in his background in obeying the things of the Lord. I mean, you see David, he's on the back hillside tending sheep, talking about the Lord, writing his psalms that today we read and we say, oh, these are so encouraging. But some of them were probably written in some of the darkest times of his life, the most fearful times of his life. But nevertheless, he had a relationship with God and he, he knew who he was and he was secure in his identity in, in God and he walked in obedience to God because he understood that, mm, another scripture, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. He understood that long before it was ever written. But you see, he shows up on the scene and Saul start, or Goliath starts shooting his mouth off and he says, I'm going to cut your head off and I'm going to feed you to the fowls of the air. Let me just tell you, anytime your enemy starts cutting up in your life, anytime he starts being a blowhard, let just understand this. He knows he's going to lose. And he's trying to intimidate you into believing something other than the truth. You see, because my Bible tells me that at the cross and then from the tomb, all victory and power was in the hand of Christ. And today, because I have been baptized into Christ, I now step into something that's not me anymore. I now abide in Christ and Christ in me, the hope of glory. So because of this, I now can walk with boldness. And when the enemy comes and says, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that and I'm going to. Can you see David? He's like, yeah, I'm going down to the river. I don't know where Lauren Martinez is, but she could be up here dancing, singing that song. But he goes down the river and he says, I'm going to get me five stones. And, and Goliath is hollering his head off at him, trying to scare him. And, and David says, look, you come at me with a sword and a spear. You're saying you're going to do all this stuff. But I'm going to cut your head off with your own sword. And then I'm going to feed your flesh to the fowls of the air. Because, see, unlike Saul, when he went out and did stuff on his own, David says, but I come to you, not in my own power, not in my own strength, 
But I come to you in an understanding of who I am in God. And therefore, I come to you in the name of the Lord of the armies, which you defy. And he will deliver you into my hand. You see, when I begin to read the scriptures in the New Testament and I understand that Jesus said all power and authority is given unto me. And then he tells me that I give you all power over the power of the enemy. I understand. And I wish somebody in this place would get a revelation of this truth. That the authority or the ability that the enemy has to fool around in your life is not have to stay that way. You have the authority to rebuke him. You have the authority to resist him. And he must, the Bible says, flee from you. But it will only happen when you understand who you are in Christ. You see, it's having a confidence in God. It's having a confidence that whether I live or I die, it's still gain. Because whether I'm here, awesome. God's got a plan for me to use me. But if I die, then glory. I get to be with him finally for all of eternity. I get to enjoy the pleasures of heaven for all of eternity. So whether I live or I die, it's gain. But you see, then I begin to think about I am more than a conqueror. You see... The enemy comes into your life and he begins to talk to you about the things that you know God's already taken care of. That you've already got the victory over because of what Christ did in your life. And he comes to you looking to pick a fight with you over things you've already conquered. And we're so dumb sometimes that we want to pick a fight with him and say, no, 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 I won. Let's fight. And then somehow he convinces us that we lose and then he gets a foothold of dominion back in our lives. What is wrong with us as the people of God? When we understand that we have been anointed and called and chosen by the almighty, the sovereign king of all kings. And he has commissioned us to do a work for him. But yes, somehow we allow some defeated foe to be able to have influence and dominion in our life. I cannot help but think about all of those throughout Scripture and throughout history who gave themselves to be martyred for this gospel. The writers of the Scriptures talk about them and historians talk about them. If you've never, had, if you've never bought or if you've never read a, the book, Fox's Book of Martyrs, I would challenge you, just get it. It'll mess you up. Here's why. Because today in our culture and in our society, all we ever think about is us. Lord, I'll serve you if it's easy. I'll do that if you, if you put everything right in a perfect row to where I just stumble into it. I can do that. But if there is any little bit of trial or tribulation, we're checking out. Leave me on the bench, God. I don't want to get in the game. I'm okay warming the bench. But that's not what God has called us to. You see, I can't, I can't help but think about those who gave themselves to be martyred. Those who allowed themselves to be thrown to lions. Those that allowed themselves to be torn asunder. The history tells us that they would stuff them in a, in a big hollow log and then they would saw them in half. And we think it's so bad because I can't get a 50 cent raise on the job. I don't know if God will ever answer my prayers. What's wrong with us? But you see, the blessings and the favor of God always follows. Matter of fact, my Bible tells me that if I'm faithful and obedient to his command, that his blessing and favor will overtake me. I can't outrun the favor of God because God says he's being obedient. I want to bless him. I want to bless him. But we're always saying, give me the blessing and then I'll do. That's not what God would desire. So I wonder about them. What caused them to be willing to do that? To sacrifice themselves. To be burned at the stake. I believe it's because they understood the language of the kingdom. You see, when I'm walking in obedience, then I go back to there's nothing that can separate me. And I can't wait to be with him. Old song, until I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. 
I can't wait till I get there. You know, I have, there's the old saying, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to hurry up and get there, right? They're just like, hold on, cowboy, I'm not in a hurry. I like it here. You see, my goal is not here. My goal is there. As a matter of fact, I'll even tell you this. My goal isn't even to stay saved while I'm here. I'll explain. My only goal is to take somebody with me when I go because I'm determined. There's no question. I'm making it. I don't have to hope that I'm going to stay saved. I'm going to be saved. I'm going to walk in obedience to the scripture and to the will of God. So this morning, if we realize that we speak the language, then we understand that our enemy, no matter how great he presents himself to be, that no devil in hell can stop us. There's nothing that can stand in our way. Sure, it can cause us to be shaken at times. Sure, it can cause us to, to slow down. But I would tell you this morning that God always challenges me with every message that I preach. And I'm always afraid of Monday. I am. Because I know I'm about to live it. But I want you to understand, the only time when we get discouraged or downcast or frustrated in our walk with God is because we took our eyes off of him and put it back on us. And we're probably getting really close to getting out of obedience and beginning to justify all the reasons for why we aren't going to continue to do some of the things. It just obviously it's not the will of God for me to do that. If it's here. It is the will of God for you to do it, and you ought to walk in that. So having an understanding that we have authority over the ability of the enemy should give us great encouragement and should cause us to continue to walk and walk by faith and to be able to see the great things of God in our life and have an understanding that because we're in Christ, we are victorious and have an understanding that when he comes to present issues to us or to try to cheat us out of the things that God has already promised to us, we do not have to entertain the thought. You see, I think, I think about the Lord when he was in the wilderness and the enemy came to speak to him. You know, the, number one, the devil is, he is dumb. He's dumb, right? So he's going to talk to God in the flesh and say, if you would just worship me, I'll give you all of your stuff. Do you see where I was just talking about this, right? He comes to pick a fight with us to talk us out of the stuff that we already got. He says, you know, if you would do this, I would give you this. What's wrong with you, fool? I already got that. It's already mine. And so he comes to the Lord and tries to talk the Lord out of the things that are already they're his. And you think he's going to do something different with you. I mean... He doesn't have any new tricks. He's the same guy he's always been. He's always been looking to usurp authority that ain't his. And he's trying to convince everybody else if they would just be disobedient to God. That it'll work out in the end. Foolishness. So James writes and says, resist the devil, he'll flee. Remember, he's a pretender. He's powerless. The only power that he has in your life is the power that you agree to give him. I don't, I don't think some of you heard me. That was really pathetic. Because here's the, here's the deal. When I am born into the kingdom, the Bible says that I have been translated from the kingdom of darkness. I am no under, longer under the dominion of the evil one. But I have been translated into the kingdom of his marvelous son. Therefore, he has no governing authority over me. He has nothing over me unless, unless I give it to him. And I'm afraid to say that too many times we oftentimes give him the foothold in our lives. Instead of smashing his ever loving foot in the door. You know, as a young child, I would say probably about 10, 11, 12 years old, I, uh, I used to pray, and I still pray really simple prayers. If you were close to me when I was praying, you'd be like, 
what is this guy? He sounds like he's seven. But God's my dad. He's my father. And when I was a child, I, I used, I was so upset. Now, you got to understand a young child thinking this way. I don't know. Something was probably wrong with me. But I, I would hurt for people who were in the way and then left. As a child, people who would struggle because of the attack of the enemy. And I would pray. I prayed this almost every night. I said, Lord, and I had this baseball bat, Louisville Slugger. I said, Lord, if you would just wake me up in the middle of the night and you would let me see the devil in front of me, I'd beat him to a bloody pulp. I did. And I want you to know that I don't necessarily pray that anymore because the Lord already beat him to a bloody pulp. He already defeated him. I don't have to. You see, I never have to get in the ring with the devil ever again. Never, never. All I got to do is throw word bombs into the ring with him and say, you know, you, you already lost the battle for the battle is not mine, but the Lord's. I mean, I can just run through the scriptures. He's got no power in my life. The Bible says that he goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Please help me this morning. He is a pretender. He's not a lion. He's trying to be like the lion of Judah. And when he comes roaring in your life, just realize that he knows that if he doesn't intimidate you, you're going to throw him out. You remember the man, and I need to stop. Do you remember, do you remember the man that ran around with no clothes on in the, in the tombs? And the Lord shows up. Remember, he shows up on the, on the beach, right? They're going to have a beach day and a picnic and all that. Well, I don't know what they're doing. And here comes this naked guy running up to him, right? And he identifies himself as legion. We're many. There's lots of us in here. But they make a statement that's very telling to the Lord. They said to the Lord, if you cast us out. You need to understand something. They already knew that all that had to happen was a word, and they were in trouble. So right away, they begin bargaining with the Lord. If you cast us out, will you send us into those swine over there, those pigs over there, so at least we have another form to go into and we can destroy it? When the enemy begins to come in your life, and you got to hear me this morning. If you are walking in obedience to the will and the purpose of God for your life, if you have surrendered yourself to him, when the devil begins to act out in your life, just tell him, out. Get out. You have no place. There's a story that was once told. I was actually, a couple weeks ago, I was talking to Brother Kurz, and I was talking about this message, and I probably preached my messages five or six times. I don't know. I get too excited about it. But I'm talking to him, and Brother Kurz says, that reminds me of a story. And I thought, you know what? I heard that story. And Brother Kurz told me, he said, well, when you share it, make sure I get credit for giving you that story. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Kurz. But the story is of this old preacher. He's in bed. He's sleeping, right? You've all had these moments. Musicians, you can come. And he's in bed sleeping, and all of a sudden, there's a noise in the house. So the, the old preacher gets up and reaches under the bed and pulls out his M9 and gets all loaded on these. And he gets up, and he walks downstairs, and he's sleeping, and he's like, what, what did I hear? And he walks into the living room, and sitting in his chair rocking is the devil. <laughs> and the preacher goes, oh, it's just you. <laughs> Show yourself out. And he goes back to bed. I tell you that story to tell you this. You need to be aware of your enemy. Because he's a slippery fox. And he will, he will trick you. He will deceive you into believing that you don't have the things that you already have. He'll trick you into believing that the things that you know you ought to be doing that you're not doing, that you can justify them and it's okay. But the reality is, he has no power, no dominion over you unless you give it to him as long as you're walking in obedience 
to the Lord, to his word. If you are here and you're a guest, you, you can all stand this morning. I, I know this is probably maybe a little bit different than what you're accustomed to hearing. But the, if, if you are a guest here today, I, I would simply tell you this. Obedience is of the utmost importance. They sang the song, I got the Holy Ghost down in my soul, just like the Bible said. It's not because Parkway said you need to have the Holy Ghost. It's because the Bible said you need to have the Holy Ghost. I've been to the water and I've been baptized, not because Parkway or Pastor Tim said so, but because the Bible says. Matter of fact, John, the third chapter, Jesus speaking makes it very clear that unless you are born again into the kingdom of God, unless you're born of water and spirit, You'll not only not see the kingdom, but you'll not enter the kingdom. So if you are a first time guest here, I'm thankful that you're here. And I want you to understand that, amen. We're glad you're here. And here's why they're all clapping. Here's why they're all clapping. Here's why we're all glad that you're here. I know some of you are here to witness a baptism. Um, I would tell you that if you're here to witness a baptism, there's no reason that you can't celebrate today your baptism as well. Okay. I'll just throw that out there to you. But Jesus makes it very clear that if you're not born again of water and spirit, if you've not been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, the Apostle Paul writes and says, if you have not the Spirit of Christ, you're not none of His. It's important. Now, I'm not going to judge those that are outside of these walls, these doors, but if for every one of you that are here today, this is the Word of God, and it's for you. And because you know you are beholden to be obedient to the Scripture. And so I would make this invitation to you. If you've never repented of your sins, or if you've never been baptized by immersion, not Parkway's way, but the Bible way, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of all your sins, you're under command to be obedient to the Scripture. If you've never received the infilling of the Holy Ghost, evidenced by speaking with other tongues as the Spirit of God, not as some teacher instructs you, but as the Spirit of God gives you the utterance, you can have it today or on Tuesday at Sister Jenny Miller's. Right, Brother Keith Nichols? <laughs> I was pretty jacked when I heard about that. But God wants to do some marvelous things in each and every one of our lives. But before we can realize the great riches and the splendor of the kingdom of God, before we can be overtaken by his blessings, we must walk in obedience. Obedience is love, trust, and action. If you love him, you'll trust him. And if you trust him, you'll step out in faith in the moments of where it's uncomfortable. And you'll stop saying, well, if this person goes up, I'll go up. You'll just feel the Lord tugging at you and you'll say, here I am and I'm going. And so this morning, whether you're here for the first time or you've been here for a long time, I think there's enough that I gave you today that you ought to be able to assess where you're at in your own life. When I talk about the fruit of your life, the actions of your life, if you're living in sin, there's no possible way you're in obedience to God. None. None. Our culture today has made a whole bunch of things acceptable and okay that are in disobedience to the Word of God. And if that's where you're at today, you need to make those things right. And then start with Him. Start afresh with Him. So this altar is open this morning. I would ask that you would come. You would spend some time talking to the Lord. Lord, search my heart. Give the Lord access today to the recesses of your heart and your mind. Those things that nobody else knows about, those things that you have hidden away that maybe even you have forgotten about. But allow the Lord to stir that within you.
that you might be able to find a place of repentance. That you might be able to find a place where things are now right between you and God. And that you will be able to leave this place knowing I love him because I obey him. And because I obey him, his love continues to manifest in my life.